Welcome to my presentation uh, tonight, uh, especially on this very rainy day, at least now it's not uh, raining. So I'll start by saying that I slightly changed the title of my presentation. Um, previously it was advertised as, uh, oh and by the way, this, Sorry, shall I use it? Or? Yeah, it won't record. I should? Oh, okay. I'll try like this. Is it a one? So as I was saying, yes, I'll try not to shout too loud. Um, my talk was originally advertised as relativistic uh, fractional dimension gravity, which is fine, was the title of one of my papers, but uh, I prefer to use this uh, different name. And again, I'm trying to use my pointer, uh, but we realized that <laughs> I don't really show up much on the screen, so I uh, might. Uh, just go close and point directly <laughs> over there. So Newtonian fractional dimension gravity is the more general name of my uh, gravitational model, uh, which is kind of linked to the problem of uh, dark matter. <laughs> the universe, right, like this. So at this point, um, checking my audience, I'm supposed, I was supposed, uh, I, I see physics students, even physics faculty and so on, um, Basically, since this was supposed to be for a general audience, I'm just curious to check how many of you have already heard about dark matter. Can you please wave? Oh, the vast majority. <laughs> so my talk is over. I don't need to continue. That's it. It's done. All right. No, okay. So I will um, still uh, be uh, assuming uh, no prior knowledge and continue by seeing, uh, let's see if the this works. So where do we start? Okay, I'm saying, well, let's start from the class syllabus. <laughs> and uh, I just left my students a few minutes ago, because on Tuesday we do uh, labs, essentially. And this semester I'm teaching one section, it's basically Physics 101, and now it's called 1100, Introduction to Mechanics. And uh, um, I have a group of about uh, 35 uh, uh, mainly engineering students, also science students, and so on. And so what's my point with this syllabus? Well, I know it's kind of, it's hard to, to read, uh, however, never mind, don't, don't uh, strain your eyes. Uh, suppose you are a student here at LMU, well, okay, <laughs> some of these guys are. You are taking a class, and on day one, your instructor gives you the syllabus, and you start reading it, and again, believe me, uh, it's uh, hard to read, but at the beginning, okay, there's all my general information. Then I start talking about uh, the topics, the objectives, the learning outcomes. And this is the introductory physics course. So it's basically mostly Newtonian mechanics. And at some point, we even go into Newtonian gravity. So everything seems fine. Uh, general information, test exams, and so on. And then near the <coughs> end, there is a kind of a strange statement. I'll make it bigger for you, so you can read it. I'll give you a few seconds. Here we go. Sort of a warning. Take a look. And, uh, <laughs> so, so I started teaching here um, in 2000, as Rhonda was saying. So this is my 25th year at LMU. And then uh, almost every year I was teaching the, the sequence of introductory physics uh, plus other courses, so I'm very knowledgeable about all this. <laughs> However, I claim that I'm also very ignorant. 95% <laughs> of my subject is com completely unknown to me. So my uh, question would be, how would you react <laughs> to a <laughs> syllabus like this? Okay, <laughs> okay I, I'll tell you what. Uh, we actually ran four sections of this. I'm teaching only one section. <laughs> so if you don't like uh, to join my class, you can easily join. <laughs> Dr. Berub is in the back, in the back, is teaching one of the other. <laughs> All right, so this, this was a little bit of a joke. My syllabus, um, this is my syllabus, but I do not place that statement at the end. <laughs> but I should, and basically that's the point of my talk. Because if you Google this question um, on any uh, source uh, online and so on, I have to click over here to get the answer. Okay. Invariably, 
you get something like this, this pie chart. And that's where I get my 5% of knowledge and the remaining 95 if you combine the dark matter and dark energy of absolute ignorance. All right, let me, let me explain, uh, first of all, quickly, visible matter. This is the stuff that we know very well, not just in physics, but in all the other sciences, chemistry, biology, uh, applied uh, sciences, engineering. So this is basically the standard stuff. Uh, atoms, molecules, then we go all the way down to particles, and obviously all this uh, makes up all the stuff in this room. Uh, uh, solids, uh, uh, liquids over there, <laughs> the bar, gases, and so on. And then also the same stuff, uh, as we also call baryonic matter, okay, makes up all the, all, the, all the stuff that we have, that we know well in the universe. Planets, stars, galaxies, and even more exotic, uh, more exotic astrophysical objects. Uh, if you think of black holes, okay, black holes, uh, if they come from a, a stellar origin, okay, we understand those, so basically they're also in this 5%. However, then there is the other 95%, dark matter and dark energy, uh, they're just names, and I will explain a little bit better on the next slide, but at the moment, uh, on uh, February 20 at uh, 5.47. No, actually, I checked this morning <laughs> if they have been discovered. No, nobody knows <laughs> what dark matter and dark energy are. Okay, here is the same, similar pie. Same idea, just uh, slightly different. Okay, I got all this from the internet. So, uh, so there's still the 5% here. It's called atoms, but it's basically the same as was saying. Um, a quick history of dark matter on this side and dark energy over there. Uh, it's a long story. Um, dark matter came first. The name originated uh, even more than 100 years ago. Some scientists were saying, like uh, Lord Kelvin and others, OK, maybe uh, in the universe there is stuff that we cannot clearly see. But uh, it did not become a problem until first in the 20s and 30s, um, when uh, observation of clusters of galaxies were showing up something strange, and then even more in the 1960s, 70s, okay, <laughs> when uh, um, the problem became very prominent in this uh, rotation curves of galaxies. And here I'm showing a picture of Vera Rubin, famous astronomer of those times who was essentially instrumental in pushing forward these ideas. OK, um, I was going to try to give a simplified argument of the dark matter problem. <laughs> but I need to put my microphone down one second. Okay. okay. Is it OK? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll place it here. <laughs> All right. I hope it's still recording. So I'm Italian. You know, Italians like to use hands a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the idea is the following. Astrophysicists or astronomers are studying a certain structure. It could be a cluster of galaxies, could be stars moving around in a galaxy, and so on. And they can measure the amount of mass from the visible light. And they say, OK, we know how much mass is in the system. And then they use Newtonian gravity or even um, Einstein's general relativity, if it's needed, and they figure out the motion that should follow from the amount of mass, uh, given all the conditions. And they say, OK, so this system should be moving like this. And then they observe with all sorts of telescopes, all sorts of stuff. And instead of moving like this, they observe that things are moving faster. So that's the key. There is a discrepancy between what is kind of predicted using Newtonian gravity and what you actually observe. Things seem to be moving a bit faster. At this point, you have two possible solutions. Okay, the easiest one is to say, well, maybe we did not include all the matter that was supposed to be there. Maybe there is more matter in the system, which simply for some reason we cannot see, dark matter. Or maybe 
Newton and Einstein and needs to be refined, improved a little bit. Maybe there's some other way that we can solve the problem. All right, Vera Rubin, um, I had the pleasure of meeting her a couple of times at conferences and I talked to her briefly once. Uh, she was one of the first pushing uh, this idea forward, the observation that, uh, you know, there was something weird in these rotation curves. And uh, she was having a very hard time to, uh, in her work at the time for two reasons. First, these ideas were very you know, novel, new, and nobody was believing them. And then obviously also because she was a woman in a highly domin male-dominated field of astronomy, okay, so all sorts of stories about <laughs> the problem. Sure. However, the idea of uh, um, a problem like this, dark matter, then became accepted especially in the 70s and the 80s, and became bigger and bigger and bigger. And so, all right, 5% known in dark matter, much and much more. There are possible hypotheses on what this dark matter might be, so let's cut it short. Either could be some uh, uh, exotic particles, yet undiscovered as of today, okay? <laughs> or even some bigger objects in the, in the universe, like uh, um, black holes that are unaccounted for and so on. But again, as of today, nobody knows. Big mystery. And then very quickly on this side, OK, maybe now I can have my microphone back. Uh, dark energy, or even worse, 68%. This came later. In 98, uh, I was uh, uh, still a student at UCLA. I went to a conference, and there was this scientist, Dr. Permutter, first up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gave a, a talk. And basically, that was the start of the dark energy uh, problem, the dark energy idea. Oh, no, I have to use my hands again. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. OK, similar, but different. Now is the, basically the expansion of the universe. As you know very well, okay, the, from the original Big Bang, the universe is expanding, the galaxies are receding, moving away from each other. But people were saying, okay, this expansion should slow down a little <laughs> bit at least. Why? Because gravity is attractive. So expansion, but slowing down. But no, in uh, 98, these three people, who then won the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, proved uh, by measuring this weird uh, type of a supernova that actually the expansion of the universe is even accelerating for some unknown reason. Okay, here there are also some theoretical explanation. Okay, um, this dark energy could be something uh, that is like a vacuum energy which is driving an expansion. And however, and nobody knows what this dark energy is as of today. So do they really exist or, okay, or else? <laughs> All right. So I move a little bit quickly into particle physics. Why? Because as I was also in my uh, bios, uh, I was not a trained, I'm not a trained astronomer or, or astrophysicist, um, especially when I was younger, okay, I started getting interested in mostly in particle physics. Uh, when I was back in Italy, even a bit in high school, but mostly in college in the early 80s, everybody was excited, or, or everybody in the physics department, <laughs> <laughs> was excited about, okay, this idea, okay, the, the CERN um, accelerators in Geneva, which at the time it was only this small uh, loop here called the SPS. For the first time, the Europeans were doing better than the Americans <laughs> at this game. <laughs> All right, in 1983, for example, I was in college in Italy, and a group led by an Italian scientist who later won the Nobel Prize discovered these two types of particles. Okay, over the, the Z and W boson, and that was a great discovery. Filling almost this table on the left, which is basically the table of elementary particles. And uh, so
So what's the point that I'm trying to make with this slide? Okay, for those of you who don't know much about elementary particles, this table is like the equivalent of the periodic table in chemistry, yeah. only down to the elementary particles. So these are all the standard particles that we know very well. So that's five, the 5% five I was talking <laughs> before. So it's all here, and the table is full, and we know everything. And by the way, after these two were discovered in Europe in the 1980s, I guess uh, the top quark was discovered here at Fermilab in Chicago and then went back to the bigger accelerator, the one which is currently still active in Geneva, the big uh, LHC, okay, I cannot really point it, the one which is a 27 kilometer um, accelerator underground, the border between France and Switzerland in Geneva. <laughs> they discovered the Higgs boson, the last particle on this table. But that's it. They did not discover anything beyond. And here there was like other particles here unknown. And that was the possibility of discovering dark matter as some new exotic particles. But so far, absolutely nothing. And there is not much hope that they might uh, discover anything. Okay, that's just uh, the reason why I wanted to show this table of particles. So, uh, and also on a personal note, when I came to study here in the US, uh, yes, I went to UCLA to study theoretical particle physics and so on, but my advisors, the professors over there, were telling me, careful, the field of particle physics is kind of complete. There is not really much to do. So, well, why don't you look into astrophysics? Why don't you look into my advisor at UCLA? She was very, uh, very much into dark matter, so she introduced me to the next point over here. Okay, <laughs> the famous um, galaxy or galactic rotation curves, first studied by Vera Rubin and the others. This is also an animation. Okay, let me just. Uh, Another one which I borrowed, uh, okay, over here, okay. So this is supposed to show the same galaxy, but in two possible ways. So obviously, the center of the galaxy with lots of stars and all the other stars rotating more slowly on the outside. Uh, this could be, for example, our galaxy. And of course, the motion is quite slow in the sense that I believe, okay, let's write it again. Uh, for example, our sun, I think it goes around our galaxy in more than 200 million years. So it takes, <laughs> takes a while. <laughs> However, okay, here's my question for the audience. One is supposed to be purely Newtonian, and the other one is supposed to include potentially dark matter. Mm -hmm. Which one is the one with dark matter? To the right, why? Because remember my hands before. Okay, things which look like they're going faster. Okay, that's where the dark matter might be. Okay, let's try it again one more time. <laughs> so in fact, if you, if you look uh, especially to the stars on the outside, there is no doubt that over, over here, over here, on the right hand side, these are rotating faster than those on the left. So this is just a simulation, an animation. But it's supposed to kind of show the differences. So basically, Vera Rubin was observing galaxies. They were supposed to move like this. On the contrary, they were moving like that. And a quick fix to this would be, oh, maybe in this one here, there is more matter, dark matter here, which makes things go faster. And that's the idea. However. <laughs> okay, it can be done in a slightly different way. Oh. I was going to, okay, oh, a few equations. <laughs> if you don't like them, you, you can close your eyes, no problem. I was going to uh, write them on this board, but then I realized we take too much time. So, that's just, uh, so this is Physics 101. And the students in the room will say, oh, it's elementary, it's too easy. All right. <laughs> Newton in... Uh, when was it? 1687. 
publishes this famous treatise on mechanics and so on, and says, well, if we have, uh, I keep using the wrong point, over here, two masses, for example, big M and small m, at some distance, distance from the center, so, okay, they attract each other because gravity is attractive, and then uh, Newton figured out that the force, the gravitational force, go, uh, depends on the two masses, and then is the famous inverse of the square distance of the square of the distance, one over r square. And the force of gravity is very small because of this constant, which is very small in standard units. So we are all attracting each other in this room, but not by much. <laughs> okay, we can strong only if we have something big under us or other things. And then, okay, what's the, what's the next step in Physics 101? Well, this uh, mass small m could be one of those stars orbiting around, as long as we, as we give it uh, the right uh, circular velocity, and this one could be orbiting around. So quick calculation in Physics 101, we tell them, <laughs> take the force and then set it equal to the centripetal acceleration, which is mv square over r, cancel out all the terms you can cancel out, and you get v square as a function of the other stuff. Take the square root and you see that in Newtonian gravity, the circular velocity as a function of the distance should decrease like one over the square root of the distance, which is this behavior A. And which, uh, right, let me backtrack a second, is exactly showing here on the left. You see, this is the same graph. All right, which, uh, I'll run it again, one more, which shows that the stars on the outside have less circular velocity than those on the inside. But again, the observed behavior is this one. Again, you can put a lot of black matter and fix the problem. Or you can do it in a slightly different way over here. For example, OK, this is an oversimplified argument of my <laughs> NFDG, so it's very simplified. So for example, suppose the uh, gravitational force doesn't go like 1 over r squared, but only 1 over r. And the students here will object. Well, objection is wrong, and it goes like 1 over r squared, not 1 <laughs> over r. OK, wait a minute. Suppose it does. And then you, you try to do the same calculation as before. A little bit of algebra. The radius disappears. The velocity comes out to be essentially a constant. And you get behavior B, which was, by the way, okay, keep going back and forward, the same as this. The velocity becomes almost constant with radius. All right. Again. You can assume that there is a lot of dark matter, which would be increasing this big M. OK, you put more mass there, and you get this one. Or you can explain it like this. Bottom line, my, the main idea of my NFPG is to assume that uh, perhaps there is a, the force, the gravitational force, can kind of somehow vary, like 1 over r to the d to the minus 1. What is d? is the fractional dimension, the famous Newtonian fractional dimension. OK, there it is. The fractional dimension, which can change, maybe continuously, even from uh, 1 to 3. So if you have d equals 3, you get standard Newtonian behavior. If somehow you get close to d equals 2, you have the other behavior, which represents the galaxy, which gives you trouble. And if this is true, you don't need that matter. You, you are solving the problem by saying, well, maybe Newtonian gravity needs to be changed a little bit. That's the basic idea. But uh, I'm a uh, Newtonian fractional dimension gravity. It's just an attempt. It's just a model. OK, so I'm not saying that I, I solved uh, the problem. And uh, it's just one of many out there. However, not is the time I started working on this uh, before I was doing other, other type of models. I uh, basically introduced this in 2020 
why, okay, COVID times. <laughs> I was at home, I even had a sabbatical, so basically I was at home for, for one year. So I had lots of time to write these three papers and uh, to try my model. And then I, here I will just mention there are many other alternative gravities model. And the other one is MOND, which is not mine. MOND has been around since the 1980s. And uh, basically is the one which is most famous nowadays. Trying to explain the same stuff without any dark matter. So this is why I was trying to connect the tools to see if my model was kind of related to the MOND. And yes, OK, there are some connections. All right, uh, time-wise, all right, I should maybe speed it up a little bit. So I'm going to quickly show uh, a few more slides. OK, if uh, the physics students are interested, they can ask me later. But I will be very quick. So my model is more complex than just the basic ideas I was showing before. It's loosely based on the stuff called fractional calculus, in particular on this integral here. Uh, I got this idea when I was teaching uh, an advanced class one day, an advanced in which I was discussing Gauss's law. And I kind of say, OK, maybe there is a good uh, way to extend it to any dimension d. And so I started uh, working a little bit with the equations. And then, OK, for the physicist here, then you can essentially you can rewrite Newtonian gravity with other formulas like this, where you see everywhere there is this variable dimension d, 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 and so on. If uh, I put d equals 3, all those equations and the others become purely Newtonian. But I can leave d totally unrestricted, anything positive, basically, and I have a different uh, theory. So basically, an FDG is like taking uh, uh, Newtonian gravity and extending, say, it works for any, any value of the dimension. And then, and then you play with it. Okay, you try to, to see for different galaxies if, uh, uh, if you can fit or I can fit those rotation curves with my model without placing any dark matter. Okay, just to explain how this is done, again, I'm not an astronomer or an astrophysicist. I go on available catalogs, like this Spark one. <laughs> I get all the data. And the galaxy, typically, they give you data for three components. Galaxies might have a central spherical bulge, the bulge. Then they typically have a big stellar disk, which is like a disk with all the stars going around. And even a gas component, because there is usually lots of hydrogen, even some helium, loose around. So basically, all this information is in the database. And then you pick, uh, for example, one of the, I think there are 175 galaxies <laughs> in the Spark da uh, database. So far, I studied uh, 9 or 10. Okay. <laughs> this, uh, I'm going to show the, as an example the first three, and then basically I'm done. All right, this was the first I tried. Some uh, galaxy uh, somewhere out there. It's a spiral galaxy, beautiful picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is, these are kind of the data, I'm going to point directly here, uh, that you have to fit the, the black dots. As you can see, they're kind of, they flatten out, like in uh, the situations I was describing before. Okay, let me explain a little bit. At first, you try just with Newtonian theory. The Newtonian theory fails pretty much because the Newtonian theory has the decrease in the speed. So forget Newtonian. Let's try something else. So first, I tried my equations purely for d equals 2 without changing anything. And at the top, we have the equivalent uh, dimension plot. So the red line d equals 2 throughout all distances. And with a d equal to theory, it's not bad. OK, I, I'm getting close to the real data. You see, it's already flat. OK, but it's not perfect. Then I remember there was that MOND, uh, the other uh, um, model that I was kind of following to see 
if my model was in agreement. So I took the, uh, the mod relation, I used my equation, and I got the blue fit, which is already pretty good. And that would require the dimension to be more or less between 2.0 and 2.1. And then I used just my model, leaving uh, the dimension totally unrestricted, can be whatever it wants to be, <laughs> green curves. Okay, so there are some oscillations more than before, but in this way, my green curve can fit all the data perfectly as long as this galaxy has a fractional or fractal dimension which follows the green curve up here, more or less between 2.0 and 2.1. I don't know. Again, this is just the model. I'm not really sure there's the reason. But what's the, what was the possible um, reason that this galaxy behaves like a structure of dimension d close to a value of 2? Well, maybe because this is a, a galaxy which is dominated just by the disk. So there is no spherical bulge at the center. And the disk is a mostly kind of a two-dimensional object. So maybe this could be the reason. All right. And then I did two more. OK, well, disk, bulge, and gas. So the, the, the trio, one which is disk dominated, the next one dominated by the central bulge here. This one is called, in particular, the Little Sombrero Galaxy, because uh, <laughs> loosely look like. There's also a, another galaxy called the Sombrero Galaxy, which looks more like, like Sombrero. OK, this one, however, as you can see, there is kind of a, a strong uh, circular stuff. That's the bulge. And then the disk, OK, horizontal almost, and the gas. Same idea. One has to fit the black dots. If you try Newtonian curve, fails miserably. If I try the purely d equals to, write d equals to, no, it doesn't work here. d equals to doesn't work. It's too high. And so I use the other two ways. OK, the blue is when I mix my model with bond. It's uh, better, but it's not perfect. Or I can leave the dimension totally unrestricted, whatever it wants to be. And of course, I get perfect agreement as long as the dimension of the galaxy with the radius, I mean from the center going out, kind of follows this curve, which settles between 2.4 and 2.5. So not, not an integer value, but somewhat in between. Explanation possible. I don't know, it could be that this is a combination of the central bulge, which is three-dimensional, and the disk, which is mostly two-dimensional. Maybe this is the reason why I'm getting something in between, 2.4, 2.5. Again, this is just an attempt, OK? And then finally, uh, one which is even more strange, <laughs> dominated by gas. And this is an irregular galaxy again, somewhere over there in the universe, which has been studied also very well. Um, because this is supposed to have a, a, a lot of dark matter in it. And again, we have the, all the data. You see that the, the data point here are kind of strange. They even increase with radius. Only here, it kind of becomes flat. And Newtonian doesn't work at all. <laughs> D equals 2 doesn't work at all. The mound relation fits the points, but not perfectly. And then finally, if I just leave the dimension uh, be whatever it wants to be, my green curve, OK, green curve over here, all right, which settles around 1.4, 1.5, I can get a very good agreement. Why does this galaxy showing a behavior uh, with a dimension even smaller than two? Obviously, my, my hypothesis is that when you have a gas component, it might even reduce the dimension of the galaxy below two. And this one doesn't have a bulge, so there is no three-dimensional component. And the combination of the gas and, and the stellar disk brings the dimension down even more. 
All right, let me get to my conclusions here. So, all right, well, I'm simply saying galaxies might, in my model, might behave like fractal structures with a variable dimension. Uh, so if you want to see more, if you look in my web page, I modeled others, and basically I got similar results. And uh, so it's just an attempt of the many out there um, to model galactic dynamics without using any dark matter. It's also related to other models, like the famous MOND, I found some points of contact. So far, I'm able to model all the, the galaxies I tried. I'm able to model with my, uh, only I wish I had more time <laughs> to, to continue <laughs> with this research. Okay, I did one paper, I wrote one paper on the relativistic version, but uh, I think it needs to be improved. And of course, uh, more work uh, needs to be done here. So if you are curious, again, I have a general website where you can find links also to all my papers. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, like open their window and grab them. Billions and billions of dollars, or actually <laughs> euros in the case of, of CERN. And, all right, I'm trying still to use my point. This is a particle detector, one of the many at CERN currently. I think this might be ATLAS or CMS. So I, my particle physics is a little bit rusty, but I think this, this thing is bigger, is surely bigger than the library here. <laughs> All right, so it's a huge detector in which essentially, suppose it's one of these CMS or, or ATLAS. There are two counter-rotating beams of uh, protons and antiprotons in the NHC. They collide head-on in these uh, detectors. <laughs> they produce millions and millions of other particles. And then there is very complicated electronics, which uh, basically measures everything. Wow. And then everything is checked again the current years of particles. Uh, the those are related to the, the in fundamental interactions and also special relativity and everything. And if there is something missing, something wrong, something strange, something weird, <laughs> I guess the software gives a warning of a possible detection of something not predicted. And then you say, OK, could this be, could that be uh, the detection of the Higgs boson? And yes, okay, in a few years ago, they detected the Higgs boson in this way. So they are never uh, detected uh, easily, okay, to answer your question. So are those, like, kids, so are that kind of like, like blood types or DNA? I mean, it... Oh, you're talking about the particles. Yeah. So no, those are just the elementary particles. Okay, let me explain a little bit better, in the sense that uh, somebody in the audience uh, um, probably wanted to ask, uh, OK, here on, on the left there, there is the standard electron. Uh -huh. We all know, OK, yeah. the electrons is very well known. What about protons and neutrons, which are the, the other two important particles making up atoms and then so on? Well, they are hidden here. Uh, OK, I can point perfectly. Uh, protons and neutrons are a combination of three quarks. A proton is two up and one down. And uh, the other way around, a neutron is made of two down and one up. So protons and neutrons are kind of like that. OK, protons and neutrons are there. The electron is here. The particle of, of, uh, the particle of light, photons, is right there. All the other stuff is kind of uh, weird additional particles. <laughs> but still, we know they exist. So this is still just the 5% that we know very well. Wow. And, uh, Crazy. And again, it, it, it takes lots of money. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, okay, so now I'm going to get away from my question. Um, so, so how does the concept of gravity differ from conventional theories of gravity? And, uh, my model or, or any similar model. So again, um, 
what we call conventional gravity or conventional theories of gravity are again essentially two. There is Newtonian gravity, the one with the famous equation from 1687, oh, yeah. and then there is Einstein's general relativity in nine, introduced in 1915, which is just an extension more complicated than Newtonian gravity, but essentially explains the same thing in a different way. Those are the standard theories. <coughs> then you have a bunch of alternative theories. Most of them were introduced uh, fairly recently to try to solve dark matter and dark energy problems without using any dark matter and dark energy. And uh, there are uh, many, many dozens <laughs> out there. OK. Um, so are there some aspects of Newtonian fractional dimension gravity um, that, when applied practically, just don't seem to make sense, or the math breaks? OK. Um, so far, uh, I didn't find any problem or any inconsistency. But I modeled only like, uh, again, about 10 galaxies and so on. Um, what is giving me a little bit of trouble is the other one, the relativistic fraction. Right. This is why I asked for to change the title. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I only wrote one paper on a relativistic extension of my model. I mean, it's fine. Uh, but I'm not uh, totally happy with it. <laughs> okay, so that it, it doesn't break down, but it, uh, I was trying to see if uh, there was a quick way to explain also dark energy, and uh, so far I haven't <laughs> really reached a conclusion. <laughs> wow. Okay. okay. I, I think I get that. Um, so how would you respond to what Google says oh. when we ask <laughs> it, how many types of gravity are there? Google says, there's only one type of gravity. Uh, I was aware of this question. <laughs> <laughs> so I do All right, I give you two possible interpretations. Um, the first is okay, there's only one gravity because there's only one gravity. Okay. <laughs> there's only one gravity force. You have to figure out uh, which is the right theory model of that. But probably Google was referring to the fact that gravity is only attractive. So there is only one gravity because we haven't found any repulsive gravity. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, if you pick some of those charged particles, the electric force, uh, you know, uh, positive and negative attract each other, mm -hmm. but positive and positive or negative and negative. Oh. Uh -huh. So the electric force comes in two kinds. Mm -hmm. Gravity so far only, only one kind. It would be great to find uh, repulsive gravity, <laughs> because it would you know, make everything easier <laughs> to fly, to move, and so on. Um, <laughs> once in a while, there is a claim in, uh, by some physicist, oh, we discovered uh, the fifth force. I remember still when I was a student in Italy in, in the 80s, the fifth force was supposed to be repulsive gravity. But basically, uh, as of today, we don't have it. Um, okay, so Google was correct. Google was correct. Okay. <laughs> just want to put it out there. Um, so how do you, in your work, balance, wait, how do you, in your work, balance mathema mathematical proofs, like the study, and observation physics, mm -hmm. like the future work, mentioned in your... Yeah, so again, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to match with my model. Um, all the astrophysical results which are available on those catalogs and so on. That's the problem, is that uh, I would need much more time, for example, just to finish that catalog and see if all those uh, 175 galaxies can be fitted correctly. So you always have in physics, obviously, as in any other science, to confront yourself with the reality. Only that in astrophysics, unfortunately, we cannot do an experiment <laughs> and make a galaxy here in this room, a micro galaxy, and, uh, and do it directly. That's the big limit. So we can just check the, mo the models, and not just mine. For example, MOND, the MOND model, is the, 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 the best out there. They, they were able to match that model with most of the astrophysical data situations, but not everything. So you have to make sure that everything works correctly. So when you test yours against one of these, 
How long does it take? So, for example, to fit one of those uh -huh. guards? Yeah. Well, at the, at the We're beginning... talking days, years? Uh, well, years. no, okay. Practically, it's all done with a computer, a code, a simulation that I have. Uh, obviously, the first time I set it up, it took me quite a long time. Then I also had a, a couple of students uh, uh, doing thesis with me, so they helped me check in some of these. Um, otherwise, when, when you have everything uh, ready, the, the computer simulations run like for three, four days and then I have my results, something like this. Oh. So no, not too bad. Oh. On a standard computer, no, yeah. no super computer. Yeah. Nothing like that one. Huh? Um, in proving your theory, how do you choose which equations to build your proof on? That's a hard one. Grab that. Good change of slide. All right. Um, oops, no. <laughs> Let's go forward. So now, for example, at the beginning, I had no clue how to okay. try to do, to try to introduce a model in which um, uh -huh. the force could vary continuously. So I started reading about fractional calculus, which is that. I knew, I knew it existed, <laughs> but basically I had no, uh, um, no idea of the details. And yes, I checked out a, a, a few books from the Yay! library Yay! Yeah. on <laughs> fractional <laughs> calculus. Books for scientists, oh, right, I love yes. it. <laughs> and so well, I came across the, this theory and said, okay, maybe I'll, I'm going to try using this. So basically it's just a matter of uh, looking into the field of mathematics uh, and uh, try to find uh, equations, theories, which are surely already there because the mathematicians are typically have already thought about uh, everything. <laughs> I don't know if there are any mathematicians <laughs> in the room. But I'd like to hear that. <laughs> thanks to the, the math department. And so that's basically how I started ah. doing this. Okay. Um, I want to switch, and I, we're going to go to the um, questions from the audience, but I want to have one last question for you. Can you talk about your lute playing? How did you come to... Oh, the lute, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, um, I had to get something non-science in there. Uh, well, I played a classical guitar, so a few years ago I bought myself a lute and say, okay, I'm going to learn how to... I can play it. Uh, the problem with the lute uh, is uh, <laughs> an instrument, well, mine is a Renaissance lute, I think it has... Uh, 11 strings or something like that. Whenever I tune it, the lutes are notoriously difficult. It takes like half an hour, 40 minutes, to tune all the strings. Wow. By the time you're done, <laughs> you, know you have other things to do. <laughs> you have the lesson for tomorrow to prepare. So you put your lute away and say, okay, maybe during uh, uh, spring break, Christmas, uh, summer, and so on. So no, I, I still play it, but not every and day. Where does one find a lute? I mean, oh no, you, you have, no, you, you can buy it, uh, or you have to have it uh, custom made. I had my custom wow. made by a luthier uh, years ago. Wow, <laughs> pretty cool. I, I read that. I was like, whoa, that's awesome. I like uh, that. But I'm not a very good player at the <laughs> moment. No, 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 no. That's very cool. Um, okay, I'd like to know if there's any of our budding scientists out there, or anybody who has a question? Yes, sir. Yes, in the red. Um, so oh. when you say that the oh. yeah, when you say that the galaxy has uh, 1.7 dimensions, that's because the or, or 2.5 dimensions. It's because the disk dominates like half, and the sphere dominates the other half. But that doesn't mean that spatially, if you go there, there are only 2.5 dimensions. That's just a way to fit the galaxy. OK, uh -huh. yes, thanks for the question. Uh, this is basically, I'm borrowing from another uh, mathematical theory, or actually fractal geometry, that you probably are aware of. So the idea that uh, uh, the space is still three-dimensional, but the structure might have essentially um, um, a dimension, a fractal dimension, uh, which doesn't need to be the topological dimension. Topological dimension being the integer one, three-dimensional, two-dimensional for a surface or one. And so there are some hypotheses that uh, galaxies, all right, take one of these, might really behave like a fractal uh, object. Uh, 
So technically, I don't know if I have it in my equations or here somewhere. When I talk about the dimension D, uh, I'm not sure if I have it uh, somewhere. Okay, here yeah, I simply call it the fractal dimension. Technically, it should be the Hausdorff dimension of the of the object uh, or of the space. I, I mean, I borrow this theory from again other studies previously done um, on spaces with D dimension, and then I applied. But the space is still three dimensional, also because. Our galaxy, I mean, <laughs> the Milky Way, we are here. Our space here is three-dimensional. The solar system works perfectly with Newtonian dynamics and, and all that. Got it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yeah um, I'm interested in how, at this point in your work, when you import a new set of data for a new galaxy, how much do you have to change about the code itself to run the simulation? Can you just plug in a new data set, or do you need to change not, a lot, and yeah. that slows the process down? Yeah, not, not much. Uh, well, it's, not, it's relatively easy. But then, um, for some technical reasons, I have to run these routines uh, for, for many hours, essentially to get, uh, to get a good fit, uh, all right? Essentially to get, uh, I don't know, like my green card here. Well done. I take I don't know like uh, 300 different points, and that <laughs> takes some uh, some time for computation. I should actually uh, review my uh, mathematical programs and make them actually quicker, <laughs> so that I can do more galaxies. <laughs> Maybe with the help of some students at the summer or something. Oh, they like sound, they sound like they know what they're doing. Yeah. Summer research project. Summer research there you project. Go. Yes, over here. Uh, what constraints are there on the D parameter that doesn't just let you pick whatever you want to fit the data? Well, again, if I assume I that this is the fractal dimension or the Hausdorff dimension, can be any any number greater than zero. Uh, so, but in practice, obviously, less than one is would be kind of strange. So, typically, in all the galaxies that I kind of uh, fitted so far, well, these are only three, but basically stays always between one and three. Or oh, never mind that, uh, you see, at the beginning for smaller distances, it seems like the dimension is disappearing. It's because I don't have many data points at the beginning, so my simulations go kind of weird <laughs> for uh, uh, low distances. But so basically, the reliable part uh, is kind of this part here. And again, for all the galaxies, the dimension never goes below 1. It stays between 1 and 3, more or less, something like that. Anybody else have a question? Do have another question here? Oh, yep. Did I have a question? Yeah, go. Wait, let, let, let uh, Jan give you a microphone. I was just wondering, once you kind of finalize your theories with this, what type of experimental data would you be able to sort of prove that the series is actual? <laughs> because, um, again, uh, it's almost impossible to set up an experiment to check on this. Like, suppose I could uh, set up a mini galaxy, but uh, apart from the difficulties of creating a fractal structure, uh, small like that, <coughs> Unfortunately, some people say that uh, all these gravitational models, including the dark matter paradigm, are non-falsifiable. <laughs> Meaning, uh, you can never prove that they are wrong. <laughs> and, and in science, uh, it's actually more important to show that your theory could be proven wrong. Mm -hmm. And so it's real science than just, you know, say, oh, OK, well, whatever it is, and so on. Or, for example, in another. Um, I was talking about Mond, yeah. and I have some additional slides ready for the questions, okay? <laughs> but I, well, I didn't use it. So the Mond model is the one which modifies Newtonian uh, F equal MA, but uh, they modify it only if the acceleration gets smaller than 1.2 10 to the minus 10 meters second square. And you know very well 
that this acceleration is extremely small, <laughs> and it's basically impossible to have an experiment in a lab in which you have something with this type of accelerations in order to prove that F equal MA doesn't work anymore. <laughs> However, these are the centripetal accelerations that you get for the stars orbiting around, and so <laughs> it's tough. And uh, so this is why of all these mo alternative models, uh, the best you can do is try to fit with your model all the astrophysical data and so on. And then hope that one day we will finally have the, 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 the final uh, results. I mean, we will uh, discover dark matter or not, and then the most convincing theory will take over. At the moment, I would say um, MOND is the most convincing and was introduced in 1983 by Milgram, mm. uh, who is still alive and well and, uh, and working uh, on wow. many papers <laughs> on this. Wow, he must be quite old at this point. No, he's not. Uh, I think, uh, he's 60, probably he'll have the time. <laughs>